because I'm on the far side of the right to the stage. I'll lean back. I want to start with Miguel Rivas. He is the co-anchor of the Beaverton. He's a he's a journalist. Notice how I use air quotes there. Uh, he's also a graduate of the University of Toronto and Sheridan College acting programs. Uh, he's also been a founder of the Canadian Comedy Award nominated sketch troops Tony Ho and Get Some, and is co creator and co host of the Canadian Comedy Award winning sketch Rap Beatles. So, Battles. Battles. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> well, oh, that would be a fun show too. Rap Beatles would be <laughs> great. Beatles sounds good. Rap Emma, Beatles sounds cool. Uh, Emma Hunter is also the co, uh, co anchor of The Beaverton. Um, she has had a recurring role on CBC's Mr. D, on the Royal Canadian Air Force. She has a very long resume. She's been on much music video on trial. Um, and as of recent today, she was announced as the co-host of the Canadian Screen Awards, what? which is coming up. Yes. Miguel was not asked to be the co-host. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm hosting the Canadian that. Screen Awards. Exactly. I'm actually going to be hosting the... Win, the uh, win, win. The nonfiction night. I'm uh, gonna, we're going to let them figure yeah, that out. Just and boozy night. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the best nights. <laughs> uh, and finally, Luke Gordon Field is the co creator, co showrunner, and co executive producer of the Beaverton and also the senior editor in chief of the Beaverton's website. So that certainly keeps him busy. Um, Luke is the elitist of the group. He went yep. to UCC, went to Queens, Ugh. and then he decided that wasn't enough, so he went and got a law degree at Osgoode Hall, and to make his mother very proud, he decided to go and become a stand-up comedian. And uh, here he is tonight with us, so thank you. We also have one more that was going to join us this evening, and he's also the co-creator, co-showrunner, and co-executive producer of the Beaverton, Jack Detsky, but unfortunately he's taken ill to the flu, which has uh, captured way too many people these days, so he couldn't be here with us. However, we have these three amazing individuals to have what I hope is a unique and interesting and somewhat thought-provoking conversation of what it means about fake news and satire and, and the like. So Miguel, let me start with you. Sure. Do you consider the Beaverton to be fake news? Uh, no, I consider it to be satirical comedy. It's not news uh, really at all. It, it, it references the news, but I'm, uh, as many uh, late night TV hosts would, uh, before me would say, I hope that people aren't getting their news <laughs> from us and they're coming to us for commentary on the news they've already consumed. I think it's um, a very good point because so much of what you guys do is rooted in real news. It's just done in a manner by, I don't know, who's here. Miguel, make me drink before this. <laughs> or um, touchy stories that the story is complete because it's difficult to satirize something that in two days could become taboo. So there were a couple of stories where just the, the fruition, the sort of um, the journey of the story hadn't peaked and, and sort of wrapped up. So we felt like there are certain things that are just, um, I think that, that the, the more touchy stuff definitely needs to be complete and we feel a responsibility with that. And then for the most part, as long as we are punching up, not punching down, anything goes. That's sort of where we come from. All right, Luke, well, this brings a good question for you as the uh, co-creator of this. What sort of drove you to say, this is what we need in, in this country? I mean, this happened in the United States, but the Beaverton has you know, really pivoted from being not really well known to now, heck, you guys are here. <laughs> Thank you very much. This was the end goal. This was done. How's it should have been? You, you. <laughs> I mean, I think it was just always, for anyone who, who you know, grew up watching The Daily Show like I did, um, I think there was a certain love of, you know, as Miguel said, you don't want to get your news from that, but there was, certain, there was a certain love of adding that to your understanding of the world. Um, and especially when you're, you know, kind of developing your political opinions and your critical thought, 
having someone who, like John Stewart, was able to for many years, kind of make sense of what seems at the time to be an you know insane world, and it's only gotten more insane since then, um, was very useful. So I always loved that power that satire could have. So when we started the website, I mean, you know, I would never have thought we'd wind up here or with our own TV show. We just wanted to make each other laugh and make our friends laugh, and then it kind of grew from there. Um, but it just kind of came from that same idea that you know, comedy has this, and stereo comedy has this power to it. Uh, and it's it's when you're able to kind of figure out how to do it yourself, it's a joyous process, and we just kind of wanted to get in on it at whatever level we could get our hands on. It. Wonderful. If I just remind the audience, if you want to follow along with us at Twitter, if you like what we say, tell your friends. If you hate what you say, we say, tell everybody. It's hashtag CJF Talk. So please follow along. Um, I want to ask you one more question, and then I have a, a, we have a lot, a lot to discuss. How did you come up with the name Beaverton? <laughs> um, that I can't take credit for. That was uh, developed by Laurent Noonan, who is the original founder of the website. I, I came on very shortly after he started it, uh, and. I never fully asked Laurent that question, but the understanding I got was he wanted something that was a combination of very Canadian and very dumb, because he just liked that kind of that satire of you know our logo is a is a beaver with a top hat and a you know, monocle, um, and he just kind of liked that fusion of the very silly with the very smart, um, and uh, and so I think it was it was Canadian you know with the beaver and also just like the dumbest name he could think of. <laughs> He succeeded. Yeah, yeah. Succeeded. it's really nice. It's down. <laughs> Emma, a lot of what you do is half of it is it's about the delivery. You know, you have to be deadpan in a way. What inspired you to present in the manner in which you do? I mean, I think of sort of the Saturday Night Live when they read the news, things like that. What what inspires you? Yeah, that's a great question because we definitely try to find our own voice. So there's things borrowed for sure from SNL and obviously there's our predecessors 22 and Air Farce, but I think the thing that we wanted to do with this show was have it almost, if you're going sort of through the dials or you know, if, if you're going through the you could almost miss that what we were saying was so insane. Mm -hmm. So as close to the real thing and, and less of a slow tee up to the joke and a sort of like, if you don't get it. So it's almost like if you're not listening, you'll miss it. Um, for a lot of reasons. I think uh, the pace is nice. A lot of um, sort of shows that have been in the same vein have just had a bit, a bit of a slower pace, which is great. It's a large comedic landscape. There's room for everybody. And I think, yeah, our show wanted to just bump up the pace and have that more, um, a, a little more realism and a little less goofy. Yeah. Miguel, you also have interaction on the show with what would be field reporters. Mm -hmm. They're out there presenting, um, doing a, a local story, for example. Um, what amount of preparation has to go between, you know, when you're at the anchor desk and someone's out there, is is there is it all scripted or is there anything that is just off the cuff? There, there's room for play and some off the cuff stuff, but the nature of our show is that we're, we're wading into, into difficult water sometimes and so <clears throat> we can't just fully kind of riff out bits. They kind of have to be pretty well thought out what the main joke is going to be. But then, we, luckily, Toronto has an enormous uh, comedy community that's really untapped because there's not a lot of jobs uh, in the TV industry or film industry. So, so like a newspaper just gagging for people. Oh, I <laughs> I shoot a can into my newsroom and it's not hit at all. So, so, we're, so I'm lucky enough to have come up in the Toronto comedy community. I know a lot of the people and everyone is excited to be on TV. Uh, and we're, you know, Beaverton has the, the cream of the crop to pick from. So people come in and you can trust that it's People, even though they're not on TV, they're not very green, mm -hmm. and they're super funny, and you can trust them to handle the material. And we have a, we also pull from that same group for our writers, so you trust in the material yeah, and the voice. Absolutely. How much control? How much input do you get into the uh, writing of it? You come up with your own ideas as well. It's sort of or a combination. Just just no. Yeah. Just just get it. Shut up. You know. <laughs> sort of crying. No, but it's um, it's definitely a combination. The stories break so quickly, and because we tape Mondays and shoot Wednesdays, we're often getting. I would say 40 to 50% of the show on the day. Yeah. So the only time there's ever been a real, is, is if there's um, a word or a sort of trajectory of a story or an angle on a story that we feel uncomfortable yeah, delivering in that way. And there's a very collaborative, we, I feel very safe, you know, I'm really supported. So Except for Luke, who's just a time. <laughs> yeah, very bad person. So, yeah. That's what happens when you go to UCC. Look at his eyes. Look at his eyes. Your, your high school didn't get a mention. Like, you went to just as an elitist high school. You went to Hogwarts as well. But you were in Slytherin. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Luke, is, uh, as the editor in chief of the, of the website, mm -hmm. 
Uh, do you find, I mean, you have the ability to just stay on top of everything, regardless of the fact that you're not shooting anymore, as you right. just recently wrapped up. Um, can you think of a time, however, though, from the time in which you started production and shot the show? Did you miss a big story in between? Was there, was there something that you felt, damn it, I wish we taped on Thursday instead of Wednesday? Yeah, um, the, well, I Several. mean, it's one of those ones where it could have gone bad if we had been able to shoot on it, but as uh, I'm sure everyone recalls, Patrick Brown's press conference was, a Wednesday. was happening literally as our show was airing. So, uh, you know, <laughs> not only did it uh, hurt our ratings a little bit, but also it, uh, it meant we couldn't comment it for another week. another week. Now, maybe there's an advantage to that because, as Emma was just saying, that was a story that had so many moving parts to it and we didn't really know 100% what was happening. I mean, we knew there was an allegation, we knew he was uh, making the statement at the time, he wasn't resigning, and then, of course, he did the next morning. So, that was one where it was a little bit like, shoot, we mixed, missed it, but also, you know, let's say hypothetically, we'd been able to cover that. Mm -hmm but with only like, you know, a third of the story kind of in to that point, you know, there's a chance we would have made some wildly inappropriate or, or totally wrong joke that just didn't reflect the facts on the ground. So yeah, and we, you know, with anything that happens, you know, after we film, before we air, there's always that like, oh, well, we just can't do anything about that. I mean, there's no way, you know, there's no way to literally like storm the Bell Media, you know, satellite system and replace an episode. I never thought of that. <laughs> I mean, I've considered it, yeah. But so that was the biggest one this year, where it was just like, oh, well, there's nothing we can do, but also might have been for the best, at least for the quality of the show. I mean, I'm sure it would have so, boosted our ratings. So that's a very good point, which brings me to my next question then, Miguel. Is anything off limits? I don't think anything is off limits as long as you have uh, an angle on it and something to say. I think just saying something for the sake of saying it is, is a trap. Um, what you want to do is, is really be able to put some sort of spin on it that draws attention to an area of it that you feel is not being covered. So uh, while you are trying to be funny as the primary goal, you do have to have that sort of purpose in mind. And I think that it can apply to, to any subject, but obviously certain subjects are much more difficult and should only be approached by someone who actually has something to say about it. I, I read some of the stuff that you have done on the Me Too movement, mm -hmm. talking about a sensitive and a particular issue. Uh, Emma, how do you feel that you guys handled that? Do you think that it was fair? Do you think that people were... If I may cut in here. Oh, God, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, we don't want people kind to uh, try this, so... Yeah, no, we definitely were uh, proceeded with caution. Um, because the goal of the show is not to be didactic. The goal of the show is to present an issue and have a spin on it. And so... I think <clears throat> on something that is so important and so prolific currently, I think we did it. To be completely honest, the thing that was the most difficult about it was the amount that it was coming up and the amount that we had to produce yes. that were going to be original. So if there were four Wednesdays in a row where another allegation had happened or somebody had been, you know, there had been another one that had gone down, we had to come up with, a, you know, a new way, an original way, a new joke that, you know, wasn't going to... Um, be desperately offensive, wasn't going to punch down, was going to honor the right sort of way. So if there, so that was, uh, I, I think that was the biggest challenge with that. But I, yeah, I'm really proud of the way we handled it. I feel really good about every word that I said. Well, um, I can certainly know that no one's off limits. They've taken a few shots at my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it was very enjoyable. Um, but ourselves. of course, the Pope was prominent on the website today, <laughs> so really no one's off limits. Oh, come on. I mean, if we're still like, the Catholic Church can do no wrong. <laughs> I think that bridge was crossed a few years ago. Yeah. Well, this one's a cool pope. Yeah, exactly. He's the cool He's pope. So He's cute. the cool pope who still is opposed to all things we believe in. Yeah. You should ask him to for a guest spot on the beer tonight. Yeah. Be very well. And now, now the rain's a little through the road. Yeah. Bit of a snore, maybe, on this. We're new for five seasons, though. You'd, hey, oh my god. You have the Catholic contingent watching you. Our guys. fan mail would and change. We go to heaven. <laughs> and we go to heaven. Oh my god. Ooh. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about that. Your favorite targets, certainly social conservatives, I know that. Um, anybody else, other than, I mean, obviously politicians, they're the most you know, yeah. easy to, to, to poke fun at. Corporations, usual, yeah, um, usual uh, left-wing stuff, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think our show, and as an extension of our website, is best when we're pointing out hypocrisy. 
Um, and so, yes, there's a lot of hypocrisy in corporations, not necessarily for being corporations or for being people who are interested in the or organizations that are interested in making money. I mean, that kind of goes without saying. But, you know, the, I think the biggest trend over the last two years with advertising for corporations and is, you know, wrapping themselves in the flag. And so Tim Hortons has been doing that for, you know, forever, but, you know, it's gotten even worse. So I think that was a thing that we made a lot of fun of. And not even uh, King owned anymore. Pardon? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, Brazilian owned Burger yeah. King, Tim Hortons, or whatever. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that's a fun thing to go after is, is just corporations kind of going so out of their way to, to be patriotic. Um, so that's a big target for us. But also, which is against the Constitution, by the way, too, in America. You're not allowed to wear the flag or use it to sell anything. Oh, right, with the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. what I was Why about those bikinis? <laughs> hey, they're cool, that's, but they're they not. They have a Buy America allowed. concept, too, now, so I think they're, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're being a little bit lax. <laughs> new amendment on the way. Miguel, is there. Uh, is there a time when you're coming into work and you know you guys are going through your taping process and you're like, we have to do this. This has to be done. Yeah, I think um, for us there was a huge change coming into season two, which was that we uh, we block shot season one in advance of even the first episode airing. Um, and I know what you're thinking like, wow, a current uh, affairs <laughs> news program writing stories eight months in advance. So you know, it kind of it kind of like a, was in a problem for, for us for season one and luckily for season two like we said we started taping two days before so on the very first taping Paul Manafort was indicted mm -hmm. and we had all these scripts that didn't include any of that and so we just were unsure about how it was going to operate on the first day of taping where it's like I think we have to talk about Paul Manafort being indicted and I remember we have to do that and everyone was like we are yeah it felt great so it almost feels like a live breaking news sort of story when yeah. you know when you're even though it's going to air I remember when Charlie Rose the allegations about Charlie Rose uh, came about, we referenced it, um, and in our live studio, it had happened that day, and you could see our whole audience go, man, <laughs> like they had literally yeah. hadn't heard about it. It's the closest we got to breaking a story. <laughs> There's, there has been kind of a fun, you know, like element to season two of like, you know, I love in the movies when someone like is rushing copy down three floors to get to the, you know, teleprompter or whatever, and we had to, the fact that we actually got to do that, even for our own silly little comedy yeah. show. Was a was a real fun tribute to like the, you know the journalism movies That's of old. Right. The old school way of doing yeah. things. Absolutely, the literal stop the presses and so yeah. had a giant button. I have a button. Oh my oh god. god, it's pretty fun. I don't have a button. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are using those like metal <laughs> plates from the we post. We believe right? anything. So just <laughs> tell us and we'll believe. I get to hit send. Um, Emma, is, uh, I'll ask the same thing I asked uh, Miguel. Something that you feel so passionate about or was like. You know, this is what my friends are talking about. This is what's going on in my world. Does yeah, that contribute to things that you want to present as an, in an editorial. Fashion? Yeah, I think I, I think the the me to the feminist take on stuff. I think there, it's just important, mm -hmm. and representation is important, and um, I'm passionate about that, and I wanted to talk about it, and I wanted to distinctly not shy away from it. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's two of us sitting at the desk. One is a boy, and one is a girl, and I wanted to. Which is which? Well, that's don't ask. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not allowed to anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So and I got a chance to do that. So I'm happy about that. That's very exciting. Um, is there uh, is there anything in your personal lives that help contribute to how you present it? Or I mean, obviously, being a woman, obviously that helps. <laughs> yes. That's very helpful. Yes. But no, but, but other things. Um, you know, being in, in the media world, sometimes we live in glass houses and we are in a bit of a bubble and we don't talk necessarily to what real people are, are really genuinely feeling. How do you, how do you sort of get the, the temperature of the room, so to speak, is what is there, your, what do you do to do that? Other than social media, which is yeah, an echo chamber. Right. I think, I think social media can be an echo chamber, but for the Beaverton specifically, online engagement is, is actually really important. and. Uh, to Luke's credit, the website has always done a really good job of being very available to speak to fans, and uh, I think that for me, that sort of has been the best resource for um, what's really going on out there in, in respect to how they view our show. You guys think becoming parents changed your comedy, your delivery? Uh, it's so great to be out. <laughs> it's like very the tired all the time, so yeah, I stopped thinking Emma's about Emma's a new stuff. mom. Miguel's a new-ish dad. New yeah. Luke's about to be a new-ish new parent. That's why I'm asking. No. I want to know if my comedy is about to change. It's yeah, it's going down the drain. <laughs> Great. My so. my recommendation: get someone else to write all your jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe it gives you better perspective. I think. I think yeah, so. I think so. And more desire to actually make fun of things and have fun in, in, in life. 
Yeah, I yeah. think we being a part of a show like this that's that's topical, that's sort of taking on current events feels slightly more cerebral than yeah. being in the basement of a bar wearing wigs, which we did for a decade. So that's, I'm, that's I'm nice. I'm doing it tomorrow. Well, I'm going to the show. <laughs> yeah, so, but, uh, so that's nice. Just by way of anecdote, um, when we first arrived, we just all met for the very first time. And um, it's very clear the three of you have an extraordinary chemistry with one another. And I think that that matters, especially on a show like the, the type of show that you do. Um, Luke, I'll start with you, but I, I want to hear all of the answers. Do you ever turn it off? I mean, the three of you are very sarcastic, you're very funny. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever turn it off Thank you. With, your, with your spouse, your friends, or is it always just like part of who you are, a little bit of an edge? And there's a there's a little bit of it, but no, no I, I yeah, thank you. <laughs> and so I'm, so, I'm so big compared to Emma. Turn it off. Uh, uh, yeah, there'd be constantly notes from Emma like, Look, take it down. Uh, I, no, I do because I, um, even though I do live in an echo chamber and even though I do have very hard opinions about things, uh, and I love you know pointing out when other people are wrong and would hate if someone were to do it to me and all those things. Um, I do have you know I, I practice it as a lawyer for for six years, so I do have a lot of friends who are you know still in that world, obviously. Uh, and so when we go out together, their opinions on things are vastly different from mine. They're usually much more conservative. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on the issue. So a lot of times, not that I'm studying them or mining them for materials, but a lot of times I just shut up and listen, like right. because I, I I don't you know when I'm hanging out with my comedian friends or my writer friends, you know, or my leftist friends, like you know, it is a little bit of like yeah I agree and like just right. us talking in a circle. So I do kind of enjoy having you know being a bit of a fly on the wall to people whose opinions are just incredibly different from mm -hmm. mine. So yeah, I, I will just kind of be the quiet guy around a table a lot of the time just because I like hearing other people's opinions. And, and then if they say something horribly offensive, I might go, what? what? <laughs> uh, but then I'm just back to being quiet. Yeah, right. Emma? Yeah, I think personal life is big. I have the, I've had the same partner for 12 years. I have the same friends since I was 18. Um, and so they're, you know, they sort of see through the BS, so there's not really an option to sort of, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think with Miguel, it's interesting, I, I think I could speak to this, that we, you know, at eight o'clock on Monday night, we're on, so, right, but Miguel is, um, you know, a wonderful father and has a lovely wife, and so that's usually when, at the, at the beginning of the day on Monday, we'll come in, I don't know, what's your kid do? Look at this video. And it's really just, and as the day goes on, we just sort of, until eight o'clock hits, and then we're up here. So it's definitely, it, I, I don't know if it's intentional, but we just sort of start to go, 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 go. And then once the show's done, we literally sit at a bar for two hours and just sort of go like this. And it's just it's just like sort of this roller coaster. And I think, and you've done television, that you know you sort of have to have a comfort, a comfort with when to amp up and when to come down. And the come down is very important, I think, in having a, a grounded, although you have like comedian friends and writers for leftists, I like two friends. I think I think what's interesting is that the way the show is built uh, comedically is a very classic kind of um, uh, straight man silly person kind of vibe and so Emma Emma gets to often be a bit more wacky dare I say and I'm a, I'm a bit more buttoned up and sort of uh, straight ahead and in real life I'm not like that like I'm a giant idiot and goofball and like pretty much all the time I'm gonna, I was gonna say some sort of thing about turning it off when I'm, when I'm like doing real things, but it's not. I, I talk to people on the street all the time and like too much. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah, what do you mean you're talking to people? Yeah, yeah, street? the recognition has amped up this year and I feel the need to like have lengthy conversations with everybody and uh, it was like, you, do you know me? And they're like, I really have to get going. Um, I was insulting you if you remember. Um, so, so I never sort of turn it off and then when I'm on the show I feel like I'm like more straight laced than I am in real life to the point where some guy came up after the taping and was like, man, I had no idea you were such a cut up. And I was like, oh, you came to see me tape a hey, comedy sir, show. Like, the second the camera's up, like, you know, turn around, it's inappropriate. And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> it's wrong, you know? So I turn it off when I'm on the show. Oh, that's weird. <laughs> Yeah, at some point we need to make a super cut of all the horribly offensive things you guys have said to each other when the, when we called cut, but we were still recording. And uh, there's some really uh, really dark things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Emma's been telling me about the same rash for two years. Since now. 2007, can't get rid of it. Keeps coming back. I love medical stuff. Yeah, well, same deal in other <laughs> in other newsrooms. Things that end up on the floor. Oh boy, I get sued a lot. Which do you? 
Do you get sick? <laughs> uh, you know what's interesting? On the TV show, I think people are just so used to TV comedies being able to do whatever the fuck they want yeah. uh, that they haven't. Yeah. Uh, on the website, especially when we first started, what we had, people yeah. were trying a lot. Coffee time really doesn't like us. No. Um, <laughs> because, uh, Tell why. Tell why. <laughs> well, we wrote this uh, story. Um, I probably shouldn't say the headline. We wrote this story What's implying, that, <laughs> implying that no, coffee time. Didn't. There's freedom of the press for a reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we wrote the story implying that uh, coffee time uh, was so, you know, I can't remember the exact word. It was coffee, coffee, time coffee, was time so was, coffee time. Coffee time was so coffee time that an employee was dead behind the counter for five days and no one noticed. Um, just because it's coffee time. And then, How so, dare you laugh at that? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to sue you, man. Yeah, so we got this very angry demand letter. Um, and assuming quite correctly that we were just a bunch of idiot kids who would, you know, buckle under the pressure and do whatever they wanted. Uh, but obviously not knowing that I was a lawyer, I'm sure, so I just turned These around. These guys love coffee time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Coffee time. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoy your coffee time. Do a pulse Day check. There. Do a pulse check. Bring us back a coffee time. No, I, no, actually, don't. No. Do not. It's good. Take it, throw it away. So you used your legal, yeah, I threw my legal, legal email. legalese right back at them. Yeah, and then uh, never responded. They just went ice cold silence, and I was like, okay. Nice. Yeah, it was it was a really fun like, uh, you know, I pointed to the, I mean the new law had just passed, sure. so you know, supposedly protecting uh, parody and satire, yeah. uh, as well as all the other fair comments and all the other stories of coffee time being coffee time. Uh, I just threw a very long email together, and then was like really looking forward to the response, and then they just never they never gave me the satisfaction of. We withdraw our complaint or whatever it was, which I wanted so Yeah, badly. we're very fortunate we have a wide berth in this country to be able to mm -hmm. say things that we can and with fair comment laws and, and things like that. Uh, but does it ever does it ever worry you, Emma? Like you think, oh shit, we just crossed that line. Yeah, oh, I mean my mother's gonna be calling me. Well, <laughs> my mother doesn't really get the internet, so that's <laughs> great. Um, but there's been a couple times when I've just thought, like, I just this is my son. Like if they if they come at me on Twitter, like yeah. I don't want like some of the stuff they say is so mean. And if you know if he People ever reads that, yeah. But I think I think who cares? So that's where I live in the oh what if you know he sees this horrible thing about his mother? Well they're wrong. So yeah. and the type of person you know that's so I think I don't care. I think I think when you when you choose to be an actor. So many actors are like, oh, I never wanted to be famous. And it's like, but it's obviously understood as part of the agreement. If you're very successful, public life and notoriety will come with it. And on this show, we sort of entered into a devil's arrangement where we use our own names, but we're not ourselves at all. Right. Um, and so there can be some level of confusion where people think I'm not a cut up or something, yeah. or they're like, <laughs> <laughs> they're like I'm, <laughs> which is, I'm such a cut up. Like, can someone yeah. tweet Miguel is a cut up? And, uh, <laughs> hashtag. Hashtag, hashtag Miguel is a cut up. Um, yeah. So we're always aware of like, when is the thing when people are, when like the troll armies are gonna come yeah. after us? And um, Season three. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> it ha hasn't happened yet, but it's on the horizon. Uh, well, it might not happen to you guys personally, it happens to the Beaverton account. That's, that's the beauty of the show, really, is like people feel that the brand is more responsible for something they don't like. Right. All, they, only, they only comment about our um, appearance and perceived sexuality. Yes. That's, that's all we get on the yeah. social media. Yeah. Yeah. Emma didn't mean what she said, but she does look yeah, not how I so like. Yeah, she's so fat. That guy's gay. We're like, okay, this is great. Uh, yeah. So but I I'm not just, uh, I just print off the horrible things that people say to me, and I put them all. I have my wall of fame in my office, and occasionally read them while I take a shot. It's oh, totally that's cool. a good that's idea. Very helpful. Can yeah. I come there? Yes, you can. Okay. Friday afternoons. I'll be there. <laughs> um, is you have there... to do like one per bad comments. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially I my Friday night ends. <laughs> Sunday morning. Yeah, basically. <laughs> no, I do have a character that's on there. Um, is there, uh, is, are, are there things though that when you think, okay, we're, we're doing, you know, someone's gonna really, really, really be pissed off by this. Someone's really, really gonna be offended by it. We must do it. Or is it we must do it that's, this way? That's Luke's MO, I think, a little bit. Um, whenever we do tapings, there's like, you know, you, you, we make the show for what we make, but we judge a lot of it on how it's received, lot, uh, received live, and right. oh my god, that got so many laughs. Whenever a piece would get, Ugh, we would yeah. all be like, wow. And Luke would be like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what I want. The thing I'm, that makes Luke sweat terribly, like, that gets him, like, he's really, really irate is um, puns. <laughs> like, we can be doing, you know, we can be doing oh, a very God. sort of nerve-wracking, 
need to, something that is this going to go this way or this way, but if you, like, if it's, if it's a pun, he's just doing like, oh, God, we're better than this. <laughs> Breaking it out back there. And then yeah, we did one, I, I, I have a rule on the show, we can only do one pun an episode, which sounds like it should be easy. But if you've met any comedy writer, all they want to do is write puns all day. Uh, even really good shows, like there'll just be so many puns if you break it down. So this one pun rule really gets bumped up a lot. <laughs> so finally, basically, we had on the second or third last episode, I said fine, because we had this one uh, segment that was written by the uh, hilarious David Honda, which was just all puns, and it just kept going and going and going. It was the one about the library opening oh, up streaming right. service. Yeah. Uh, and so I was like, okay, fine, get them all in, and then we're not doing any more puns the rest of the year. So we just did like, you know, uh, probably like a minute and a half of just puns, and I was like, great, and we're done. Okay. Um, but I, in terms of like, it's what Miguel was saying, because I find like so much of comedy nowadays, and not not, not to criticize anyone, but, um, although that's what I do all the time, uh, <laughs> but not to criticize anyone, life. but, you know, so much, of, so much of comedy is clapter, which is like this great term that Seth Meyers invented, where it's like, you're, you're, you're laughing a little bit, mostly you're just clapping because they said something you agreed with. Right. And don't get me wrong, we have that on our show where we say things that, you know, your average liberal, left of center, 33 year old or whatever would agree with, uh, but I like, I like doing the opposite, and I like saying something that, that punctures that bubble and, and makes them go like, whoa, what? And I mean, not to say like we would do anything that's like, you know, overtly offensive just for the sake of being offensive, but if we're still accomplishing our goals and being satirical and punching up, mm -hmm. and it can also be something that makes people, you know, gasp with shock, then that's, yeah, that, like Miguel said, that's music to my ears. Now you guys tape in front of a live audience, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And has there ever been a time when they just are like, Oh yeah, if you could, like, oh, yeah. literally we, the air is left out of the room. We, we, uh, we shoot more pieces than we air for this very reason. Um, uh, and so yeah, recently we were, you know, you, you try and find angles into every story, but some stories are too recent, particularly tragedies. Our show, you know, something that's uh, obviously an ongoing problem is gun control and gun problems, and it happens so frequently and it's, and it's so in the news cycle that I think people expect us to sort of comment on it. And sometimes you can find, you try and find a way in, and then you say it in front of people, and you're like, that was a closed door. Oh, wait, what did you do where you were like, don't wait? Because we have these uh, earbuds where the director said we're going to do it one more time. And there was one story recently where the audience was just like, you know, no, no. And Miguel's like, can you just make me do it again? Yeah, and I was in the control of being like, make him say it again. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't screamed in pain loud enough. No. Uh, do you meet these studio audience after? Did yeah. they talk to you? Yeah? yeah? Did they tell you if they loved it or hated it right away? <laughs> I feel like no one has... Because obviously you paid them to be in that audience. Oh, yeah. yeah, no, yeah. One has the, like, no one has the uh, gumption to come up and be like, I don't like you. <laughs> no, there was that one day that we started and went, if this is your comedy, that's going to be a long night! <laughs> but, but that was because... Okay. Our, that was because he was, right? That's right there! What are you doing? Our, our audience warm-up started talking to him, and he was like, don't talk to me. And then she was like, well, now I have to talk to you. Um, one more question, and then he just like clammed up, and then it was like lights down, and then he made sure to say that really loud. Yeah. I'm like, okay, yeah. you probably should have left that guy alone. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't he come up to you afterwards, though, and say, I want like, to photograph it, both of you individually and together. Okay. And, then he was, and we're like, do it smiling. We're like, yeah, he would. He smiled, he's like, now do it looking at me angry. Yeah. We were like, yeah, that's right. Sure, that's man. Happened. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm going to get a little little corporate with you. When you first presented to put this on on the net, mm -hmm. um, were they hesitant? Because look, big companies aren't necessarily willing to take a, a risk with uh, with a, with a business or or show that you know really leaves no sacred cow on turn. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, it, it's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all of them have been so good. Um, <laughs> That's a great question, and honestly, the answer is is no, not at all. I mean, um, from what I've gleaned from from Bell Media Execs is that they were kind of waiting for a show like this because, uh, not to bring it full circle, but when Rob Ford and the scandals were happening, they didn't have. I'm familiar with his work. He's a guy. He has um, a brother. We sold a lot of front pages. I can yeah. tell you that. From, and from, but from but Rob rest his soul. But they didn't have a comedy show that could comment on it. I mean, yeah. there was 22 on CBC, obviously, but the fact that American shows were, you know, covering this the scandal and, and, and there was flying no, him down there yeah. to be on the show. And yeah. there was no, you know, Bell Media, you know, Comedy mm -hmm. Network show, and the Comedy Network being the home of the Daily Show and and being kind of known for games for the Daily Show and Colbert and mm -hmm. uh, and now of course Samantha B as well. You know that 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 was kind of what, why they wanted a political satire show. So when we walked in the door, they were not only were they excited about it and, and into it, 
they wanted us to go further than we ever thought they, they would. We've never gotten a note really of, ooh, that's an area we don't want you to talk about, or, and you know, to their regret, never have they been like, don't go after this company because they advertise with us or anything like that. That's fantastic. The, yeah. you, know, you always hear anecdotal stories about, you know, The Simpsons yeah. on, being on Fox. They're constantly making fun of Fox, but yeah. Fox has never really tried to shut them down or change anything or, or family guy or anything like that. So I'm just curious if that was that your experience at all. And I'm actually part part of here. It's not. It's oh, it's, I mean, I would love to be that you know that 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 David Letterman figure where he's like, oh, the suits at General Electric are <laughs> yeah. just ruining. Them. I would love to have those stories. I just yeah. don't have any. Literally, the last meeting we had with them as we were kind of wrapping up the season was. Uh, you know, the final note was like, you know, that was amazing, but I think you guys can go even harder. And we were like, yeah. okay, let's do it. Emma, when do you say, you know what, screw you, I'm not doing that. That's the worst ever. Um, Stupid <laughs> idea, not funny. Not funny. Um, what was, the first, the, I hope this isn't too controversial, the first time. Oh, this is a private meeting. Okay, meet, great. Like being live streamed. <laughs> right, good. No, but the, the very Nobody first. Nobody about this. This was in season one. The very first time we sort of tried to handle, um, it was the rape statistics in Sweden yeah. versus in Canada. And it was just about, um, which was a very difficult thing to make fun of, but I think they did it really well. And it was sort of just pointing out how the stats are um, inflated to the benefit of the country looking good. And it's not sort of a true reflection of what the numbers actually are, which was great. But I just thought the, the word itself was a lot and constant and it can trigger some people. And I just had an honest conversation saying like, I think this is going to, the jokes are going to get lost in the weight of this word and what it means. And it's important to say it, but there's got to be other la la la. And, um, and we had a long meeting and the rewrite was exceptional. There was no questions asked. It was like, absolutely, we're all on board with this. And um, the piece it's hard to believe that the piece is is funny and it, it, it hits the right note. It's sort of coming from a place that we think is right. It's pointing out an issue, and um, it was a piece I was pretty proud of. Um, so that was a one where I went like, can I? Um, yeah, something. Uh, yeah. I think we also um, gained have gained confidence, Emma and I, over the two seasons to just be like, that ain't funny. No, and if we an asshole. and if we do do that. <laughs> <laughs> to, to Luke's credit and, and uh, the, the network's credit, they're always like, okay. Like, we, I remember uh, probably four or five weeks ago, we, we had a, the closing piece of the show was coming up, which is our like point counterpoint kind of sketch style that we do. And we just were like, this doesn't work. And it was like 10 minutes till we were taping. And then we were like, we didn't even know we could do this yeah, it was so far like, along. We were like, I don't think we want to do this. And then, and then Jeff just like, oh, he's not here. Just like ripped it up. And like, no, you don't have to do anything. We were like, okay. oh yeah. <laughs> You just feel this responsibility being like the, the host of the show or the lead of the show of that you want to like make well, sure everyone's face. work is being well, recognized. Well, in you're thinking like we can't really bump against lines, right? We should find a way to make it yeah. work. It should come out of our mouth naturally, but this isn't, you know, lines in a script in a fictional show. This is like, I mean, I guess it is that, but it's it's with issues that are a little more important than like, um, I don't know. We just I'm, want our show to be funny. Yeah. You know? We just want it to be really funny. Well, so if it's not, I love the clip so. that we play. That was probably <laughs> my go. favorite. Ever. <laughs> um, had you two met before? Yes. Yeah. Um, Emma and I have known each other for at least ten years. Ten years yeah. um, but we never we did many shows together uh, in different groups and stuff. Live we, shows. we were never actually like a, a pair working together or really in depth working together until this show. But it was it was really great to um, to hear that she was cast because. Um, I knew she already didn't like me, and so I didn't have to try and uh, earn anything. I just don't like me. And that's fine. It's work. It's not it. your life. Don't it's just for it. So making your life and Jeff's life a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. it's them not liking each other? Yeah. 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 Because we can that. divide them, you know what I mean? <laughs> 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 like other shows, yeah. they unite, and then like the show, like over time, the cast gains yeah. all the power and the writers lose the power. But if you can divide the cast, all the writers keep all the power. The cameramen are with me. I got the camera. You want to look? You want to? Look on TV, that's, talk to me. <laughs> Just a reminder, uh, if you can follow along with us on, on Twitter, it's hashtag CJF Talk. And in about 10 minutes or so, we're going to wrap up our formal discussion, or informal discussion, and, uh, and open it up to the audience. So I hope that uh, you have some riveting questions, especially for Luke, who has an obscene amount of knowledge on William Lyne and Mackenzie King. So, Ooh. yes. No one's going to ask about that. He knows a lot about that. So open the Wikipedia page and try to come <laughs> out to it. <laughs> his, his nickname was Bill. <laughs> um, is is there is there a time when you sort of look at what you're doing right now, 
you know, I don't see it happening, but what if they come to you and say, okay, forget it. You guys are done. You're canceled. Oh. I know. Well, tell the story. Oh, so I. Oh, here's no, a real I'm sure funny. A story here. Here's a real <laughs> funny, goofy gag that's yeah. just nothing about funny and yeah. hilarious. <laughs> Is we were in the writer's room yeah. um, back in March, and this is just so funny. The thing about it is how funny it is. And, and you're gonna laugh real hard when you hear this. Um, I, we, I had an audition for another project, and I, and I slipped away at lunch, and it was, it turned out to be the day that we got renewed for season two. But it was coming down to sort of a crunch time whether or not we were gonna be renewed, um, sort of. And then I went to the audition, me and Emma, you know, frequently were like, yeah, I wonder what's going on with the show, and we'll back and forth all the time. And then, so I'm at this audition, and she, she texts me, Oh no, um, the network showed up like bad news. Like, it's bad news. It's really bad. Wrote, and I was like, really? Like, like confirmed? Yeah. She's like, yeah, you better like come, you better rush back here and we can like make a plan or some shit. So I was like, oh fuck. And just if it wasn't clear, we found out we'd been renewed while you were at the audience. Yes, like, everybody knew that we were losing our mind. I have a way we can amp this up even more. Let's tell Miguel and do that. So, so, then I, okay. so then I got in the car to go from the audition to the writer's room, which is probably about 15, 20 minutes. Due to traffic, took well over an hour. Yeah. Uh, which point I called my wife and told her that the show was canceled. Oh, have daughter, she knew. And then, yeah. and, then and, the day, and, and the energy in our room is progressively getting lower as we realize how mean that was. Yes. Everyone's like, is this still gonna be? I imagine every three minutes, one writer going, "No, it is funny. It is funny. It's funny, right?" Yeah, yeah. It's funny. Yeah. 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 And then yeah. I showed up, and they were like. Um, just kidding. kidding. <laughs> and I said, He's like, sweaty. He's like, you call my wife. I was like, oh, I, did, I didn't even. I just was. Like, I just was like somber. I was like, oh, okay. That's <laughs> that's actually uh, that's a good thing. This is a good day. <laughs> <laughs> when I when I journal about this later, it's gonna be fun. But I, if we do get a season three, I I will try to do it again. Hundred <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. percent. Yes. Well, I can't imagine you guys not getting There's... getting more opportunity to do it. This is so much fodder out there. There's so much going on everywhere and anywhere and every corner of the world. I, I know President Trump is like literally helping sell New York Times and New York Post and the, the, okay. the yeah. uh, Washington Post has helped their subscriptions. Um, but we don't quite have that right now in Canada. We don't have that equivalent. Um, even though I personally think some of the things that the current Prime Minister says are a bit goofy, but it's not quite as World, like it doesn't grab the world's attention. Right. So how do you? you I, I think he's. I think he's more famous than any prime minister in my lifetime. Well, for he, his songs, yeah. But but whatever the reason, he does grab the world's attention way more frequently than. I, mean, I think if you ask the average American during Harper's uh, uh, prime minister, well, while he was prime minister, a lot of people, like the regular person, would be like. Harper, Harper, like they wouldn't, they wouldn't, they would have only the vaguest understanding. Whereas Trudeau, for better or for worse, for wrong or right, is a you know pretty pretty bona fide celebrity, yeah. I would say. But you want to make fun of the government too, though, right? Mm-hmm. You want to make fun of their policies. I mean, you're a policy wonk, you know this stuff. You want to be able to sort of rip the, those sorts of things apart. And I haven't really seen that. that. I haven't really seen that yet. Well, I, I think Trudeau like reflects the, something that Luke loves to destroy, which is. Canadian smugness, where we think we're better than everyone all the time in every single area. And so I think one of the Beaverton's aims and successes has been puncturing that bubble to be like, no, take a good hard look at ourselves in, in all kinds of areas. And I think Trudeau's celebrity sort of comes with this, this stereotype of Canadians are exactly like this and it's only good things. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, you know that's obviously not true. And so him being so prominent, and us able to attack him for that sort of hypocrisy, yeah lends itself well to commentary in the country. So let me turn, it, turn the question around a little bit then. What do you want to do more of? Ooh, that's, I mean, again, Damn, that's much. a good question. Um, so commentary. Um, I think, you know, second season certainly had the theme of the Me Too movement. It, it, it almost started like a couple weeks before we premiered and, and obviously ran throughout the course of the second season. Um, I'm very interested to see where that goes. Obviously, we've already seen the backlash to that build. Um, so I think there's a, going to be a lot of powerful satire to point out in that world. Not that I want more sexual harassment to happen, obviously, but more uh, openness about what's been happening for years and changing that system would be wonderful to both see and comment on. Um, I do think one thing that's going to be very fascinating over the next year is is how Andrew Shear attempts to define himself. Um, because I think he hasn't succeeded so far, but he had that very derided commercial, hey Andrew, how's it going? Um, which was, you know, we, 
you could satirize, but it was already a satire. It was like the, the Kelly Leach video. Um, wow. So Just do the work for you. Yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah. Well, so I, what I'm very interested to go at is how both him and, and, and Sick, but especially Sheer, attempts to get people to actually like him instead of just not like Trudeau. And so I think, you know, if we're fortunate enough to get a season three, that'll be a big thing, because we'll be ramping up towards the next election, of and, course. And same with Jagmeet Singh. I mean, yes. the same answer. Absolutely. Yeah, I and mean, he's almost charted a course where he's, he's, he's Trudeau again. He's an international celebrity, and, and, he, and he has very interesting, you know, uh, wardrobe choices, and he's very cool, and he's sexy, and everything else. Uh, yeah. But we already have Justin Trudeau, so it's like, how are you going to differentiate yourself from Justin Trudeau in that way? So that'll be fascinating to watch. But frankly, I think it's it's going to be also a question of the liberals are really, they're becoming a scandal of the week type government, yeah. which a first term government, you usually don't see it as much. Usually yeah, that's a second, second term. term. Yeah. So scandal of the week kind of stuff, which they, you know, maybe you could say they pulled themselves out of a little bit, but it's still happening a lot. Yeah. Even stupid ones like people kind, which was a bad sure. joke or whatever. So if they keep doing that, then that becomes a huge thing to talk about as well. One of the things that I certainly noticed watching um, the Beaverton is you guys do make fun of us being Canadian, you know, mm -hmm. being, uh, and, you know, our curling, throwing, hockey, playing, Tim Hortons, sipping, you know, nice people. Um, Emma, is there something that you would like to do more of in the, in the next little while? And, you know, that maybe not necessarily, I mean, it's a national show, so you have to be cognizant of that. but. I mean, Toronto has a raccoon problem. Wouldn't you just like to like, do, a, do a whole show based on I what a raccoon says? I'm obsessed with raccoon stories. It's like we're kindred spirits, but I just <laughs> think that you have to be so cautious about, first of all, like Toronto centric stuff. Yes, this exactly. Stuff, obviously, hopefully, most of the nation the rest is of the watching. Country, so but you know what I love? Toronto. If we're just gabbing, I would love to do uh, streeters. I'm a big fan of those streeters where you just go into the crowd and. Harass people. And, no. <laughs> um, but sort of. You know, use people on the street, and I think there was that incredible thing Mercer did with talking to Americans. But I think we could do that here, and that would puncture our bubble a little bit. Like it's not Americans who are just stupid; we are just as stupid. And we can, you know, we can acknowledge that sometimes we're not these um, sort of witty, perfect um, hippies that we like to, <laughs> with the exception of you, uh, uh, that we like to sort of Thank portray you. ourselves to the rest of the world. There's there's room for that. So yeah. I think, um, um, but. Uh, Network and blah, but I think yeah, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of room to puncture ourselves, and I love that we do that. I think we could definitely do more of that. Miguel? I think what I would like to do more is episodes, mm -hmm. um, seasons, <laughs> 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 jokes, Being more jokes. <laughs> yeah, and I mean I say that as a joke, but uh, I'm such a cut up. But I feel like that it's actually sort of it's sort of true where uh, I feel like we sort of only found ourselves um, strongly footed in season two. Yeah. And we really were getting into a stride as the final few, few episodes came around. And it felt like, oh man, I, I, I want to talk about everything. And, and, and like you said, yeah. the news has never moved faster in terms of what people are aware of. Yeah. So our show, most, most news shows cover eight to 10 stories a, a, an episode. We cover 18. Yeah. And um, even that, it's too slow. <laughs> <laughs> it's too slow. Do, you get, do you get a lot of suggestions from people like, oh, why don't you cover this? You mm -hmm. should really do this. Yes. Constantly. Yeah. I had a brother in like, a like, lawnmower. You should do that. Like very serious stuff, though, or is it always like my stupid crazy cat video? Like, it, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of, you know, funny, cute, small town stuff. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, I'm trying to think, like, you know, if, if a video goes viral of, like, you know, there's a moose on the highway or whatever, they're like, you should do that. And we're like, all right. But it's, uh, but it's already a joke. That's the thing. It's already, yeah, the moose already did it. The moose beat us to the joke. The highway is. There's a car on the highway. The satire is the moose. <laughs> so then there is that, and then there's also um, there's a lot of messages about that, and then there's also a lot of messages about, uh, like I said, like I, I can't believe you guys talked about that. Like, and so sometimes being like, "Whoa, that's cool," and sometimes being like, "How dare you try and make fun of this issue?" Which you know is a fair perspective. Although my opinion is, as we've already said, like. But are you, do you disagree with the point we made, or are you just mad that we would dare talk about yeah. this subject? Because if you say, I'm offended you would ever talk about this subject, I say, okay, well, we just disagree there and we'll move on. Right. If you disagree with that, we went at something the wrong way, or we ended up punching down or whatever, then totally fair criticism. There's a lot of requests, please make fun of my town. Yes, yes. So I can imagine. Well, we get a lot this of emails. House in my town, <laughs> yeah. it needs to be pointed we out. We get a lot of emails from Beaverton, Ontario. <laughs> uh, and I don't mean people in Beaverton, I mean the city of Beaverton, Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> City officials email us probably once a month being like, would you guys like to film here? And I'm like, 
I don't know, what do you got? And they're like, I mean, our name's Beaverton. And I'm like, yep. yep. Uh, so we're just like, we'll fit by the sign, and, uh, and we'll just be there, and like, what's your plan? And they're like, I don't know. <laughs> we're Sudbury people. Roll, roll. <laughs> we're Sudbury and Hamilton people. Have you ha ever had uh, torn the mickey out of somebody pretty, pretty badly, which you guys have done, and then met that person? Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Is it right uh, now? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Mine was pretty benign. You, you, you oh, save yeah. your ire for my, my post media overlord, so you know I'm fine with that. I, um, I have met Ezra once, I think. Oh yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean we, you know. Did you guys fight? Uh, no, I mean spaghetti. I, it was it was a very passing thing, um, and I you know I mean there was no there was no awkwardness to it because with that it's so transparent. He hates us and we hate him. Like yeah. it's very clear. So it's, There's nothing to say. It's exactly. not like anything where we gotta pretend to be friends. Yeah. Um, but kind of there's fun. some people, yeah, there's some people we've just made offhand jokes about, like, you know, just celebrities that were just like, you know, this is a funny thing, and then we meet them, and it's like, hmm, and then you can tell they did not like it. But the one, and, you know, he, already, he always gets so much love, so why add more, but Chris Hadfield, who, um, we wrote two articles, we've written two articles about Chris Hadfield, both of which have gone, gone viral around the world. Yeah. Um, and so, like, and you know, space. yes. <laughs> so we wrote one about him years ago, years ago, about him when he came back from space, about because he was, you know, tweeting, YouTubing the whole time that his Rogers data bill was like through the roof or whatever, like sort of whatever. Uh, and we were like, ha that would be funny. And then you know, it's like, hey, um, three million people have read that in China, and you're like, what? <laughs> uh, and so it, was, it just went viral, and 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 so and. We met his son first, and his son told us, yeah, every time he does a book tour, someone still, this is years later, someone still comes up to him and says, I'm so sorry about your phone bill. Uh, uh, and uh, like, not just in Canada, anywhere. So when I met him, I was very aggressive. I was like, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to cause you, yeah. you know, like you're literally Canada's fun grandpa. Like no one's, you know, no one's taking the piss out of Chris Hadfield. We just thought it was funny. And he's like, look, man, I get it. It's no problem. Like, and he was just so cool about it. And he was exactly as Chris Hadfield as you would want him to be. Uh, Lloyd Since Robertson like mispronounced my name. Now? Um, yeah, Lloyd Robertson, we did we did a, a this show was the together. Best day of my life. And Lloyd Robertson, yes. who we've talked about, I suppose, in random things somehow. Um, we met him, and he did not know who we are to the point where he was the one introducing us, and he said, "Please welcome Emma Hunter and Miguel Riviera." <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so in answer to your question, I feel like we should take a strong dig at Lloyd Robertson. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking news, Lloyd Robertson's still so alive. Who knew? <laughs> That's a pretty strong dig, I'd say. Still being live streamed, just, just pro tip. Oh, is he watching? <laughs> He's here! <laughs> Maybe. Um, there is uh, a lot more questions that I, I could ask you guys, but I want to afford our wonderful audience that came here on a cold Monday night the opportunity to come up to the to the microphone to uh, participate in this discussion with uh, Luke, Emma, and Miguel. So please feel free to go to the mic and uh, just let us know your name and your affiliation and how you found yourself here tonight at uh, JTalk. Hi. Hi there, I'm Neil. I work at CBC. I got a free ticket. Perfect. <laughs> That's great. Welcome, Neil. So I have two questions. The first question is about going with a TV show as opposed to a web series. A lot of comedians are putting their stuff directly on the internet. What, why did you guys just produce a web-only series? How did it come to be a TV show on a, a mainstream network? So that's my first question. And what's the pros and cons of doing that? The second question is, it seems to me like a lot of Canadian comedy television is very middle of the road, very safe, in some cases very hokey. Why has it taken so long for a very contemporary style young show like yours to get on the air? I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think you probably might want to tackle that first part of the question. Sure, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, at first I thought you were just trying to plug CBC Comedy's website. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, why don't you want to do a web series <laughs> instead of a television show? Uh, no, I mean, it, no, it's a great question because you're right. There is so many wonderful web series being made, and, and uh, not just through CBC, obviously, but there's so many great ones um, uh, that it, it, it is a it is a very valid question. It's, it seems like a funny thing, but it's 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 a very valid concern, especially in other countries. I would think this kind of voice couldn't get on, like you said, mainstream uh, Canadian TV, so you'd have to go to the web in order to keep the biting satirical component that was so important for us. The real answer to your question, besides the obvious answer of like, well, you know, money and everything else, 
uh, is that because Bell Media was so cool with us keeping our voice and not changing it and not diluting it and not becoming middle of the road, we had no concerns about going to TV. And, and obviously we're on, you know, we're on Comedy Network at, at, at 10 o'clock and, and that's not like being on CBC at 8 p.m. Like there's, there's a different audience there and there's a, there's a, you're, you're past the hour where you can swear and everything else to it. So, you know, kind of our comfort level with the executives and, and with Bell Media's vision for the show is, is, is really what allowed us to be confident that we could keep doing what we want to do even, you know, on TV. And the second part of the question, um, you yeah, I, I, have a, I have a few opinions about that because I think it's something when you, you grow up where you're like, you're like, I don't like Canadian TV is sort of like a popular opinion when you want to get into the industry because I want to change it and do it better. Um, I, think, I think like a really simple answer might be the internet and connectivity in general. Uh, Canada is a huge country but a, a, a sparsely populated country and uh, viewership numbers would have to rely on the in terms of being competitive with American production values and financing, would have to generate similar numbers. And to do that, you have to appeal to all of Canada, which as we're all aware, is many different regions with many different personalities and interests. Uh, and when you, know, when you make something for everybody, in most cases in art, it's terrible if that's your goal. You want to make it good, or you want to, make, you want to say something. You don't, I want to make this so that everybody likes it is almost always a, a recipe for failure, and I think that a lot of Canadian TV has been trapped in that being a financial necessity. And while it's still true um, to some degree, we can hear back from people more uh, through social media and through uh, the internet that we can understand that there is niche availability. The shows that we really like in the States beyond the, the big network shows like Grey's Anatomy or whatever, something in, something in yeah, common that they all have, well, not me, but other people. It's been on TV a long time, I thought yeah. it was good. No. It's a bad show. Place. Uh, good, good place. That's a good one. Good wife. That's a good show. Um, uh, What's happening? I think that, they, <laughs> I think that the, those shows have a niche and they're, they're, they can appeal to a more specific crowd. And I think that's something that Canada is starting to do. And it, it yields, it's turning out to be yielding massive results, I think, rather than making things generic. Yeah, or a more cynical perspective would be that I think sometimes a country, which I love very much, if the model hasn't been proven, they don't want to take the risk because there's less money and less people. But I think that historically has been something that we can do better at. Um, yeah, that might be a surprise. So yeah, we'll and credit also to, to CBC for giving shows like Baroness and Crawford, which are not obviously broad appeal shows and are very specific and, and unique to the creator's voices, uh, you know, a slot because that's a huge part of uh, what's kind of driving this current Canadian TV moment along. But mainly, uh, kudos to Bell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did I not already suck up? Yeah, yeah. Suck up. <laughs> Is there anyone in particular, Bell, you need to suck up to? Yes. Yes. Randy yeah. Let's name them up. Yeah. Randy Lennox is a great guy. He's a visionary. Yeah. Um, great discussion, guys. Uh, my name's Dale. I'm down here from Peterborough. Got tickets on Twitter. So hey! Right. hey. Oh. Dale from Peterborough. Um, so we started off tonight talking about the, the fact that it's a one week show, like the website has the advantage of being a little bit more reflective and can get watch the story and watch it evolve. Uh, Louis C.K. said, you know, 9-11 jokes, and you talk about the Miguel Tongo talk, you make a joke about anything. He said, 9-11 jokes, they didn't wait till 9-12 to write the jokes. They wrote them on 9-11. They didn't do them on 9-11. And I'm just wondering, are there stories that you're watching now that, like, we've written the jokes, but we can't, <laughs> we can't do the jokes yet? You know, that kind of... Well, there's or, or does that happen? Well, getting stuck into the story. Does that happen? We've got the jokes, but we got to, We can't do that this week. Uh, well, the the one that died that I skipped over giving the specifics for, which I'll I'll give now sure. to answer this question. Uh, the one that I did on the floor where I was like, "Don't make me do that again." Was it was it was the anniversary of the mosque shooting recently, and um, this was obviously a very prominent news story, and we made we made a story that sort of referenced. Um, the Quebec government's decision making around certain areas relating to Islam, as it related to the anniversary, yeah, and it was, happen. and I've it's never, happening. I've never felt the comedic phrase too soon so deeply in my bones <laughs> yeah. as I did uh, taping that episode. So that was one that we didn't put on air. That I'm glad we didn't put on air. Uh, and yeah, I, don't, I mean, Luke would yeah. know. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, hey, uh, I think it's. I generally like to have the perspective of hindsight. Um, so, you know, I find, you know, to that idea of, you know, writing jokes on the day it's happening, I find those aren't the best jokes because um, if you don't know the whole story, then odds are you're just kind of cutting a slice off and, and, and looking at it like that, which 
can work for one or two jokes, but you know, from a broader wanting to tell a minute or a minute-long story or a minute and a half long story on it, kind of dries up a little bit because it feels like you're not covering the whole world. Um, and you know, I think those jokes are great for shock value, which I think I've already indicated I like a little bit, but they have to be combined with uh, shock value has to be combined with making a valid point and and and, and everything else we want to accomplish. It can't just be shock value for shock value's sake. Um, so. That's, that's where I generally fall on it. I don't really have pre-written jokes that I wait a week to release. Sometimes we'll have a joke and we'll wait a day or two just to let things settle. I mean, we did do a, you know, a, a piece on the website about the, the trial in Saskatchewan, but we didn't release it the day the verdict came out. We waited a day or two. Yeah. We also just need so many jokes on the TV show that yeah. it's not really like putting them here and there. Yeah. And like yeah. there. It'll be like, oh man, this is, the, the, as soon as the show ends, it's so weird. We tape on Monday night, you're like, wow, that's such an accomplishment. Our first read is at 10 the next morning. <laughs> We're like, okay, I guess there's no such thing as a weekend or like. Yeah, <laughs> great answers. Next question, please. Oh, thank you, Adrian. Great job. Um, and I was just gonna say, I get really mad when people make fun of Winnipeg because I lived there for 11 years. Oh, we are what so dumb! <laughs> don't watch our show. Yeah, don't watch that. The Beaverton is the one outlet where when they make fun of it, I cry laughing, and people in Winnipeg cry laughing no, because you do such a pitch perfect job of doing it. There's so many great Winnipeg stories. So thank you. Uh, my question. Uh, partially joking, partially serious. Um, what is your favorite story, each of you, that you've done so far? Um, and then what are the lessons that you think serious journalists can take from the journalism that you do? Thank you. Oh. question. Um, Who wants to tackle that one first? Emma, yeah. you're okay, up. yeah. There was, okay, a shop, joke. there was a joke. It wasn't a story. It was a joke. <laughs> and Luke, you have to help me. It was, I couldn't get through it. I, to, I was really oh. embarrassing. Oh. Oh. And it yeah, was, you were it really was close stupid, recently. But it was like mascots. Remember? It was like mascots. We're expected to punch them in the face and watch them fall over. But personal caregivers should not. Remember? It was a nurse to like a mascot. Yeah, it, was, it was so good. And I couldn't say it. I couldn't say it. I couldn't say it. And, uh, but it was just, it, I love just the dumb stuff. And it was dumb and beautiful. Where did she go then? Yeah. We, both, we both love all the dumb stuff so much, right? just because you, we, we talk about so many serious issues, and like I said, there's 18, 18 issues dealt with per episode, that you have to have a couple that are just pure stupidity yeah, just to, to, to lighten light. it ourselves. Have you been to Winnipeg? <laughs> it's a yeah. dumb! No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Great city. I also went to Winnipeg. Okay. Um, yes. I, so I, but I think if we can give any kind of uh, uh, lesson to, to real journalists, Specifically, TV journalists for me and Emma, I, I would say, be be self aware and don't take yourself too seriously because we're all aware that there's a, a news speak, a way to, to talk uh, when you're when you're a news anchor, but it can remove humanity so much sometimes depending on what sure. you're talking about. And our show, unlike most other late night comedy satirical news shows. It's not me going up there, even though we are using our real names, it's not being like, can you believe this? Like, we still present as newscasters, which is actually pretty rare uh, for what's on, on, on TV now. And I hope that that satirical angle can hit with any real news anchors who might watch and the show. It's the medium you're presenting it. Yeah. You know, it's different in print, different in radio, very different mm -hmm. visually in TV. And I just want to say that I, having done this now, feel, first of all, no responsibility to give them any tips because I think it's so different than what we actually do. And then I have a huge amount of respect for navigating a teleprompter while something is happening. Because if we make a mistake, what's nice if we trip on our words, there's a blah, which happens in real life all the time. It's a joke, so we're protected by this thing. If there's, you know, forest fires happening and you're navigating it, a blip it can seem really disrespectful. So there's this immense amount of pressure. And I just, after, you know, doing this for two seasons, it's, I, I just, hats off to those guys. It's a, it's a huge responsibility and they're so good at it. You know? It's not like Miguel, it's just not even. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't get chosen to co-host with you. You stashed me on the boozy get him, night. Get him, get him. On the boozy night when Lloyd Robertson's gonna be there. Oh my god. <laughs> Lou, did you wanna weigh in at all on that? Sure. Um, just quickly on the favorite story, we did a um, uh, we did a point counterpoint with Evan Miguel, which is often how we ended the show, um, right when uh, Jagmeet Singh was chosen, and it was about um, uh, how Quebec, you know, was seen as being a huge stumbling block to NDP's election chances because they weren't comfortable with a a uh, visible minority wearing a turban uh, as their prime minister. Um, and, you know, so the whole point counterpoint was like, uh, should Jagmeet Singh himself just become racist to fit in with Quebec? Um, which is which is like a very, you know, like you, that kind of punches you in the face. It was such a great joke. 
And but we were also setting up the subversion at the end, which was because the, the story was the headline that got attention was whatever it was. I'm not going to get the number right. Seventy percent of Quebecois were uncomfortable with a visible minority wearing a, a, a turban as prime minister. But buried in that same story that came out was that I think like. 52% of English Canadians were also uncomfortable with it. So we were just sitting there reveling in the smugness of like all these racist, you know, French Canadians. And at the end, Emma, as she so wonderfully does, turned it on Miguel and pointed out, pointed that out. And just and 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 we ended with kind of, well, I guess then Kim Jong Meet Singh be racist enough to win English Canada too. And it was just kind of a wonderful subversion of again Canadian smugness, and in that case. English Canadian smugness about, well, we're so diverse, but oh yeah, Quebec are a little backwards in that regard. So that was my favorite story we did this year, I think. Um, to, the, to the journalist uh, question, yeah, I mean, I, it's not really a tip, it's more just like kind of building on what we were talking about earlier, which is just that it's so important for our show because of our format. We're not, here's the news, here's our joke about it. We're just, here's the news and that's our joke. So if we're commenting on something real that really happened and not just doing a silly local man or you know, Winnipeg's a dumb story, um, if we're commenting on a, a piece of news that actually just happened, is we need people to know that news in order to get the joke, because we don't have time to explain it. So it's just kind of so vital for our comedy, which is obviously the most important thing, uh, that people know the news. So we just kind of need you guys to keep being very good at your jobs so that people see and know the news and the world around them so they can understand our jokes. And you know, like the world around them, but mostly our jokes. <laughs> has, it ever, has it ever surprised you that some of your real news satire has made it into mainstream media? Uh, like I think an editorial? Mm. Not mine. Editorial <laughs> <laughs> quoted you or someone who said that. Understanding it or when people are confused? When they think it's real. When they thought it was real. Well, when they think it's real is like. It, I, I do, and it's, it's a sort of depressing, right? And it's, uh, it's sort of the era we live in. I think people are going to look back on this era as a deeply propagandist era where we were struggling with technology to figure out how to disseminate and consume information. Uh, and so whenever that happens, it's, sometimes it's like. Really? Like you really? Yeah. Are you in? How could you believe that? So instead of being like, I mean, maybe Luke feels differently, but I, instead of being like, yes, <laughs> I'm always like shocked when people get, when people think it's true. Yeah, yeah that was quite something. Uh, there's a couple more questions, I believe. Hello, guys. Uh, great chat so far. My name's Simon. I came in here because I heard people talking. I've heard uh, I've heard a lot of references to Saturday Night Live, to uh, Colbert's show, to The Daily Show, uh, and to you guys, to me, like you guys have spiritual roots with the Onion, and I haven't really heard any reference to that yet. I'd love to hear you guys comment about that influence, but also more specifically, like uh, on Colbert and, and and Daily Show, you have a fake person. In, in a real world situation, so like Borat does that too. Mm -hmm. Whereas The Onion has this horrible meta world of The Onion that's similar to ours, and they sort of comment on themes there. And that's sort of what makes your stuff evergreen and really, really. Um, it's more like laughing to sadness. <laughs> whereas the other show I was found out, I was taken from sadness to laughter. And I don't know if you can comment on any of that ramble. That's a very good point. No, no, yeah. yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, obviously, uh, the website especially is, you know, not just inspired by the onion, but kind of, you know, a ripoff of the onion, really. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, I mean, we, we looked at what the onion was doing and, and obviously wanted, and, and, you know, we're kind of shocked because the onion, as I'm sure everyone knows, has been around since literally the 1980s in one form or another, and it kind of became itself in the uh, early to mid-90s and, and blew up in the, in the 2000s. And so when we kind of were talking about what we wanted to do, I mean, I was personally shocked there wasn't a Canadian equivalent. Um, so, you know, there, there are equivalents in pretty much, there were equivalents already in pretty much every English-speaking country and many non-English-speaking countries, but for whatever reason, Canada hadn't had one yet. So that was our direct inspiration and everything else when we first started. When we came to doing the, the TV show, uh, I'm not sure if you watched The Onion's uh, TV show, uh, specifically the one on IFC, not the sports one so much. Um, there were a lot of, strengths there, but I, I did feel that because it was so removed from the world we lived in, is that there'd be such great jokes, and it was such a great show in many ways, but it did feel like it was so removed from the world we lived in that after five minutes or so, I kind of checked out, because it just, it no longer had that connection for me uh, that The Daily Show and Colbert Report did, because they were talking about things that I, I lived and heard. So 
that was where, you know, again, not to in any way, you know, disperse the onion, but I, I did feel we could learn from the onion show in that way by not quite being as abstract as they were from the world around them. And I think they, I could be wrong here, I think they did have a similar shooting schedule as we did in season one, which was they block shot everything and just released it the way you would a sitcom as opposed to a current event show. So that made it difficult for them to keep up with the Colbert's and the Daily Shows because they couldn't comment on, you know, like what George Bush did that week or whatever the case was, or I think it was Barack Obama by the time the show came around. Um, so that was a, a, an interesting lesson in its own way as well. Um, I think as a performer too, a reference point that I always drew back to is uh, Chris Morris, who, did, who uh, yeah. did a show called The Day Today in the 90s in, in England. And that show is presented similarly where they don't actually ever break the fourth wall. But unlike The Onion, they're commenting on real things that are happening and, and going very absurd after presenting a real nugget of information. Um, so that, that's what I would look at for, for my reference point for the show. Yeah, yeah and I'm an, I'm an actress. And I went to a, <laughs> uh, I was a, an actor when I was young. I did a classical theater. And uh, so for me, it's and just straight mimicking. For me, I wanted to seem as much like an authentic newscaster as possible and almost ignore the joke. So instead of like a stereotypical way of stand-up delivers, delivers, or builds and builds and builds, I just like plow through it and that way the jo uh, that's my favorite way that a joke lands in this world. Um, and uh, just exceptional. Yeah. <laughs> 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 to have the confidence to end a sentence with yeah, that, I'm just exceptional. <laughs> so we have time for our last two in line for questions, so please go ahead. And I've also been tickets on Twitter. Victoria, hey. youth and academia, welcome! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, my question, my first question is, um, what does your audience look like um, in terms of the show, the, um, the website, is there a difference? And then also, all of you have spoken a lot about puncturing our bubble, and I was wondering if or how satire can shifts the shift or effect the dominant kind of narrative of what our Canadian national identity is, mm -hmm. or if you think you're just kind of preaching to the choir. Okay, who's that's on right. to talk about maybe we are. Who wants let's play first. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Look at how uncomfortable yeah. Loki's describing his <laughs> no <laughs> Don't read my body language. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is audio only. <laughs> Um, live stream. <laughs> yeah. to, to, your, to your first question, I mean, uh, we, what's interesting is in this day of knowing everything, is, is, I'm going to be honest, I don't fully know the answer to your question. I mean, with the website, I know a little bit more because, you know, Google and Facebook dad my all of us, so they give me that information, so I'll buy more advertising from them. Um, but uh, I know that in general speak, the, probably the people who are watching the TV show are a little bit, like on Wednesday nights at 10, are a little bit older than the people going to the website because a lot of people under 30 don't have cable, or if they do, they don't have, especially channels like the Comedy Network. So there's a bit of an age difference there. I think it's it's not that much, but there's a, somewhat of an age difference there. I think, especially when we first started, our biggest audience on the website were university students. Um, and I think that's that's certainly grown as the website has grown. Um, and uh, you know, we because we started as a Toronto-centric uh, website, I think we do have a bit of a Toronto-centric audience, but. You know, every time we do a story about Winnipeg or anywhere else, it kind of expands beyond that. So it's a dump. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to be clear. Um, and to your other question, which is a wonderful point and something I think about a lot, but I don't know if I have an answer to about whether we can actually change people's minds with satire or just speak to the converted already. I think you can. I just don't think it happens all at once. It's a very slow process. But even more than changing someone's mind, which is you know, they've done so many studies recently about how difficult that is, and once people set their opinion, that presenting contradictory facts only cements it. Um, one thing you can do is if you're speaking to someone who hasn't made up their mind on an issue, um, or just doesn't know about an issue, that's one of the things that I love doing on the show, is shedding light on something that isn't front page news. Um, you know, we, especially in season one, took a lot of pride in doing bigger stories on things that at the time no one was talking about. And some of them we were a little prescient on because they became very big stories like veterans' rights and the fact that you know both the Harper government and the Trudeau government had essentially abandoned their commitments to Canada's veterans, which has become a very big talking point since, of course, that the town hall uh, 
video blew up, but at the time was something that really wasn't making any news. So we, we took a lot of pride in, in shedding light on stories, and whether we changed people's minds or you know, cemented their opinion, at the very least they would know about something and they would see our you know, maybe twisted comedic take on it, but they would at least realize that this is an issue that wasn't necessarily you know, front page news or making the rounds on social media or whatever it was. And part of it, though, I might think, is like taking a serious issue, making fun of it, and it does make it memorable for people. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's right. relatable. Yeah, and I think, I mean, there's a lot of issues that comedy shows won't cover because they're trying to bring some levity to what can be a dark day of news. Sure. And I think we distinctly don't do that. So, uh, you know, we hope that there's a laugh, but but we, we're not going to not say the issue. That's the whole thing. And I think that's the big thing with Me Too. It's the big thing with Indigenous rights. the whole issue with people of color being represented. We just, if we don't talk about it, it's not there, la, la, la. And I think we... Um, as much as, you know, we're two white faces, we're still trying to talk about the issues that some comedy shows will distinctly avoid because it's just going to bring down the room, so to speak. Um, so you can. <laughs> yes. Uh, but we also air twice. We air on the Wednesday night uh, on Comedy Network at 10. We also air on CTV on Sunday nights. And CTV is a channel that a lot of people just get. And they put it on and they watch what happens on that channel. Um, and so if we have an opportunity to uh, be seen by those people, which we have been this season, I, I do think there's a little bit more of a crossover element to people who aren't searching out the Beaverton specifically. All right, last question. Hi, my name is Aaron, and uh, I'm one of the writers on the Beaverton. No. Uh, I was wondering if you were going to pretend to not get Beaverton. Yeah, Aaron, who's that? I was just here because I heard it was Cater. Who's this guy? Uh, no, uh, my question actually is to, uh, to Adrian Patra. Um, Ooh. It's about time. I know. Right? Right. Right. Actually, um, I want to express my disappointment in your professionalism. Uh, <laughs> I was really hoping you would just come in here with this chip on your shoulder and like, just like yeah. skewer these three guys for their, you know, their, their lefty uh, propaganda. But when the, when the Beaver team was first uh, sort of coming into its own, um, Rob Ford, the former boss, was one of our favorite targets. Um, I'll just read a few. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do it. Don't do it. What's the yeah, question? Yeah, we're almost, everything's going nice. There's a bar here. <laughs> you know you're cutting into yeah, our drinking time. Yeah. Right? Send them. Do you know what? Tweet them. Tweet them. Tweet them. Uh, no, I'm, I'm actually just curious as to what you thought of the publication uh, while working there. So I left mayor's office in 2011. Um, so I'm pre-crack. As I like to say. <laughs> allegedly, um, allegedly. Yeah. Crack, crack, way back, crack, way back. Yeah, because he just started. Yeah. <laughs> that was 2013. He had a couple of years to 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 form, to move up to where he where he went to. Um, you know, I here's what I would how I would answer that question. Being a political staffer and living in the world in which we were living in, um, like the fucking elevator at City Hall had its own goddamn Twitter account and CNN and Fox News had a live broadcast on this this elevator. It was, it, it was living almost like living in satire. It was insane. Um, but for those friends of mine and my colleagues that were in there in the office at the time going through all of that and that were like duck marched out of the City Hall with CNN following them to the parking lot and their poor things like their poor mothers like texting them like, oh my god, Brian, you're on CNN and not for a good reason. <laughs> walked out of the city for nothing but other than quitting the mayor's office um, you know I spoke to a lot of them and it was it was very, I'm gonna be very blunt no one paid attention to that yeah. no one paid attention to the, the the hilarity part of it so with all due respect you didn't know the tiny website that just started you, that was years away from you, being on television it didn't or have an impact <laughs> and that's as uh, candid as I can be totally there. So, in, in conclusion, eat shit, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for the question. Thank you for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, audience. Such a treat. So, on behalf of the CJF and the entire audience, I'd like to thank the Beaverton for joining us tonight and for shining a spotlight on the good, the bad, and the ugly of our cultural and political landscape. So, thank you and look forward to uh, next season. The work she put into making this a timely, inspirited, and relevant discussion. I think Adrian is
an upcoming CJ Up event on March 6th in the lead up to International Women's Day. We are joined by three of this country's top investigative journalists. Oh, they are all uh, fearless and fabulous women. Robin Doolittle, and Connie Walker uh, will join us to share their stories behind the stories, the uh, important work they did last year. And the talk is moderated by Matt Galloway. And the deadline for the Canadian Journalism Foundation Awards is uh, is fast approaching. Uh, you have a few more days. We have awards for excellence, lifetime achievement, media literacy, and some great fellowships for uh, young journalists and uh, investigative journalism. So check out our website and apply today. And finally, thanks to all of you for joining us and for supporting the work of the CJF. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite you to join us for a cocktail and continue the conversation with the Beaverton. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Thank you.